in the homework that's due tomorrow. So I had one question earlier on working sets and tau. If there's any other questions, uh, now is your chance. Or actually, office hours right afterwards are always fine, too. Yes? Would you maybe go over like, the fourth problem? The fourth problem. Um, demand paged environment. environment. Yes. So I went over this in class once before. Um, but I'll sort of go over how to think about it. So the fourth problem talks about having an array, a three-dimensional array laid out in memory. So if you remember when we talked about arrays in C, the way, is this the one? No, that's the third, that's oh, the third. third one. Oh, sorry. Four is the one with the different um, data structures. Oh. OK, uh, sorry. OK, so the fourth one said in a demand page environment, which of these structures are good? And there were things like a stack. Link list. Any other examples you remember? Hash table. Sequential search. Okay. So the way to think about this is that you've got some big data structure laid out in memory. This will be virtual memory. And we have some smaller amount of physical memory. If we had as much physical memory as virtual memory, then everything's in memory. You never page fault. The question is very easy to answer and that it doesn't really matter. So you can assume that it's a case where you don't have enough memory. So that's one thing. The second thing is it's demand page, which means we only bring in pages when you need them. We never bring things ahead in advance. So for example, one thing you could do, which is called prefetching, is you could say, if I know I'm walking an array, I'm going to intentionally bring in the next page of the array. When I bring in one page, I'll bring in the next page at the same time. So I'll bring things in before I need them. And then when I want to access them, they're already there. I don't take a page fault. So we're not doing that because we're only bringing things in when we need them. And then we're kicking them out some other time. So the question is, when we think about these data structures, which of these will do well in a demand page environment? So what you have to think about is, what makes a data structure do well in a demand page environment, and what makes it do poorly? And this really comes down to, can a page replacement algorithm keep the things you need in memory in memory, or will it tend to have the things you need in memory on disk when you need them? So what makes the difference between those two cases? Things are in memory or things are not in memory. Hopefully the project you just did um, has given you some insight into uh, when things are in memory and when they're on disk, or what kinds of data structures are good for the two of those. Um, so it really comes down to a question of locality. Is there a lot of locality in the workload where you're re-referencing things, or you're referencing things on the same page, so you bring in one page um, and use it a lot, or are you constantly referencing things on different pages all over the place? So things that are sort of randomly accessed all over the place, just like we talked about with disks yesterday, will do poorly because you'll, bring, you'll have to sort of bring things in all the time. Things that have some kind of locality will do a lot better. So the question is really asking you to evaluate and explain how much locality is there in these data structures or algorithms. Does that answer what you wanted yeah. to know? OK. Yes? Uh, could you go through the uh, concept of working sets again? Sure. So the concept of working set says if we look over time and we plot the number of unique pages that a program references, at time zero it hasn't referenced any pages. But as it runs, it'll tend to ac access a whole bunch of pages. And then at some point, this kind of flattens out when you've touched most of the memory you need. So once you've touched the code that you're running, all the functions that you call, when you've touched your stack, when you touch the heap data structures you're using, then the longer you run, you're not accessing more unique pages anymore. So this is uh, so when we when we start with this picture, we basically define the working set as the set of pages you have to have in memory to avoid faulting all the time. And so that kind of gets to this question of what does faulting all the time mean? Well, we're going to just define a constant tau which says uh, faulting all the time means you fault less often than tau. So tau is some time value. If we can run for this long without faulting, 
we consider that we have our working set in memory. If we fault more often than this, then we need more memory. Um, and so this means that our working set size is really the number of pages we reference in time tau. And the idea is, you know, if we, if we sort of um, were to shift, if we have a program that's running and we shift our window, so if we start measuring, instead of starting measuring from here, we start measuring from here, what do we expect would happen? So if we start from here instead, we expect the curve to look more or less the same. And there's some set of pages, and there's another, um, you know, this is sort of uh, time t, and this is time t plus tau here, this point. And so we expect out here that the working set size is pretty much the same whether we start at one time or we start a second later, that your working set size is fairly stable. And that the number of pages that are different between these is probably fairly small. Because it's really, what is the difference between the working set from 0 to tau and t to t plus tau? The difference is whatever pages you referenced in this window right here, and then never referenced again. And then it's also the set of unique pages you referenced in this window and had never referenced previously. So that is the difference between the two working sets, and the expectation is that is relatively small. That most of the things you've referenced um, are sort of common be between the working set at one time and the working set at the next time. And this is why we think if we keep your working set of pages in memory, you won't fault very much because it sort of changes pretty slowly. Does that help explain it? Big pile of chalk here now. Yes, Koshik. Yes. Well, you should think about does it matter when you answer the question? Or how much does it matter? Right, because there's, there's two things of it. There's temporal locality, remember, says if I bring in a page of data, I'm likely to access, and I read one byte in the page, I'm likely to read other bytes on the same page. Sorry, that's spatial locality. You read a whole page, and you're likely to access more than one byte on the page. So it's worth reading in four kilobytes, even though you only referenced four bytes with that load instruction, because you'll use the other bytes nearby. That's spatial locality, and that's a good thing in demand paging. The other thing is temporal locality that says when you reference something on a page, you're likely to reference something else on the page soon. Again, you're likely to reference the page again. And so your data structure may, those two different ways of implementing a stack may have different spatial and temporal locality, but they can both still have locality of some kind. And either of those localities is good. <coughs> so as an example, uh, to think about that, um, suppose you have an array and you're traversing an array. What kind of locality is there if you're traversing a one gigabyte array and reading every single element in it? So it's most, in a way, you could say it's a lot of spatial because you're reading every byte on a page. So you're using the whole page, but then once you're done with the page, you're never using it again. So it's got a, a pretty good amount of, of spatial locality because you're using everything, but not as much temporal locality because you don't use it for that long. What about a very short linked list, a linked list with like 15 elements in it that are located all over memory? What kind of locality does that have? Right. It has temporal locality because you're going to reuse those same 10 pages over and over again, but it has low spatial locality because you're only referencing one data item on each of those 10 pages. So that can also be good because if you have those 10 pages in memory, um, you're not going to fault on them. Yes? Correct. So number four is asking if using the data structure in something else not in accordance with managing demand paging. Uh, what do you mean? So I, no, I, I, no, I, you're I, right. I, no, no, that's, that's, that's an excellent question. So the, the, there's, this is actually a good clarification because usually I forget that people get the, are confused. So the question is not which of these data structures will you use to implement demand paging. It's as a programmer, if you use this in your program, how would you expect your program to behave, to perform? Um, has nothing to do with the page replacement algorithm or how you implement virtual memory in the kernel. That's a very good question. That was a question. Yes. Okay. Any other questions on the homework?
No. Okay, so what I want to do is I want to go on talking about RAID, and um, I'm going to do it using PowerPoint because some people can't come and I want to record what I talk about, and this it's easier to record this way than it is to get a camera recording the screen. So I'll probably use a mix of the chalkboard um, and PowerPoint, and um, we'll sort of go through um, RAID. So when we left off yesterday, we were talking about uh, striping versus this just a bunch of disks approach. And I came to the conclusion and tried to convince you that striping was great for performance because you got sort of great performance. You could have a single file using all your disks. That it was great for manageability because you didn't have a problem of figuring out which directories to put on which disk. So you knew you used all the space on your disk very evenly. But it had this terrible reliability problem and that if you lost a single disk, you lost all your data because some fraction of every file was stored on each disk. So the question is, how can we get the performance benefits of striping <coughs> with the reliability benefits of, um, or with, with good reliability or good enough reliability? The basic approach that we'll take is to use redundancy. We will store extra data someplace. We'll waste some of the capacity of our disk to store an extra copy of data so that if we lose a disk, we have an extra copy somewhere and we can get the data back. So we're going to admit that disks fail. We're not going to make them more reliable. We're just going to make sure when we lose all the data, we have another copy someplace else. And there's two fundamental ways of doing this. One is to just have an extra exact copy of the data so we store the same data on multiple disks. The other way to do it is to use some kind of error correcting code where we compute a function of the data and the way the function works it says if you lose part of the data we can use we can take whatever you computed and use it to reconstruct the missing data um, and we'll, we'll talk about how to do that. So we're going to look at how to use these two techniques to build more reliable disks and when we look at this there'll be sort of two key criteria we want to look at. One is capacity how much storage space do we get out of this system because we're adding redundancy and we can't store new data in that space for redundancy. We're storing extra copies of data, so we lose some space. And the second one is sort of efficiency and performance, which means how close do we get to this sort of purely striped system that performed really well do we get? <coughs> how much time do we waste reading and writing the redundant data as compared to reading and writing the good data? Is that clear set of challenges? So one of the things we have to consider about when we talk about efficiency, we need to know what workload we care about. So we talked about with disks, when you have the sequential access, you get some one kind of performance. When you have random access of small blocks, you get a different kind of performance. And we're going to look at the same mix of workloads. We're going to look at sequential access, which means reading and writing large amounts of data sequentially. So if you're striping, that would mean that you're reading and writing enough data that it would be striped across all the disks. So um, you know, if we have so if we have a sort of a, like a one KV block on each of these, then a sequential access would be at least four kilobytes because that would allow us, if we stripe and put one kilobyte on each of these, to read from all four disks. A random access would be just reading one, kilo, one of these four kilobyte chunks. So that's what we mean by sequential versus random. And the second thing um, we look at is reading versus writing because um, if we have redundant data and we're reading, we don't necessarily need to read the redundant data. So reading can just read, if we have copies of the normal data, we can just read the normal data, not the redundant data. When we write data, though, we have to update that redundant copy of the data also. So we care about, we'll look at reading and writing performance separately here. When we looked at a single disk, we didn't really care if we were reading or writing. We assumed it performed about the same. Okay, so the basic technique that people use is what's called RAID, um, which I say here is a re redundant array of inexpensive disks. That was the original name, but then people started selling these and really didn't like having the name inexpensive because they wanted to sell them for a lot of money. And so it was renamed a redundant array of independent disks. And if you Google for it, you get about two-thirds of the hits are for are independent and one-third of the hits are for inexpensive. <coughs> 
Um, this is a lesson. If you ever invent the technology, you shouldn't have any implications of like good or bad or cheap or, or um, expensive in the name. So I have a friend who invented a technology called a fast array of wimpy nodes. And the idea was to use a lot of low power like ARM processors or Atom processors to use 10 times as many processors, but they're lower power than like a big Xeon processor. And what he finds is that manufacturers like the name, but they don't want to use the word wimpy attached to their products. And so the name, the manufacturers really hate that term. They're trying to find, you know, some other name besides wimpy, uh, like low power, like um, fault or something, like fawn instead of fawn. Like, you know. So anyway, it's a, it's a, or fain, right. So it's a key ter thing. And if you want your name to stick, you've got to think about who is it acceptable to. Uh, and the other thing that's interesting is, is RAID was really a research project at Berkeley. They were building a database. They wanted to make a really fast database, um, but the disks weren't fast enough, and so they wanted to use an array of disks. They weren't reliable enough, and so they did a bunch of research and looked at how you could solve this, and they came up with this notion of RAID, the name RAID, and a bunch of different ways of using an array of disks for reliability. And after the fact, they found out that IBM had already done all this and was shipping products based on these ideas. They just hadn't told anybody about it. Um, but the result is that everybody calls it RAID because Berkeley wrote the papers and publicized it and IBM didn't tell anybody. So that another lesson, if you want to get famous about inventing something, you have to tell people. You can't just sell it to a small number of Fortune 500 companies. Okay, so the key idea with RAID is instead of trying to build a really fast, expensive, super reliable disk, we're going to buy a whole bunch of these cheap desktop disks um, and we're going to put them into some kind of an array um, that has better performance, and we're going to have some redundancy so that when something fails. And then um, and we're going to do some kind of striping to stripe, to stripe data around. And then the second component is there's going to be a number of different ways of doing this that have different properties. There's not a single best way of putting your data onto disk for reliability, so we're going to have a number of different techniques. Um, so, as with virtual memory and everything else, there's a set of trade-offs in terms of granularity. So I talked about, you know, putting a one kilobyte chunk of data on each disk. Um, and that would be my granularity, which would mean if I want to read one kilobyte of data, I could go read from one disk. If I want to read four kilobytes, I'd go to all four disks. This is not the only option. We can use different granularities of data. For example, there's a system from a company called Thinking Machines, which is a supercomputer company, and they put one bit of data on each disk. So if you had a 32-bit word, they'd write one bit of those 32 bits to each of 32 disks. Um, and so when you wanted to read 32 bits of data, you'd read from all 32 disks. When you wanted to write the 32 bits of data, you'd write to all 32 disks. There's other approaches where we could say, we're going to put a megabyte of data here instead of a kilobyte. So if you write a megabyte, it all goes on one disk, but the next megabyte goes on the next disk. So what is the impact of having a fine granularity striping, like a byte or a bit or a couple of bytes, versus a coarse granularity like a megabyte? Why does it matter? It says the answer up there, so it should be pretty easy to read. Right. So one thing it says, as it says on the screen, is that if you have a large granularity, then reading less than that only comes from one disk. So you're not going to improve the performance of reading um, less than a megabyte by having multiple disks. You'll get to read megabytes from different places faster, sort of more megabytes at a time, but that, that one megabyte read won't go faster. Um, what about... Um, so are there any benefits to a large granularity? <laughs> Do you believe it? Yeah. So a potential benefit is, you know, there's a challenge that a disk can only do one thing at a time. So if a, spy, if a single bit, uh, file has its data striped across all the disks, then any time you read from the file, you're making all four disks busy. Anybody reading from something else, somebody else has to wait. So it's kind of an issue of sort of the scheduling delay. It, you know, it's the same as the time slice in round robin, that if you have a very small time slice, then everybody gets to run pretty frequently, but you spend more time context switching. 
If you have a very long time slice, you spend less time context switching, but you can wait a lot longer. It's a bit of opposite here, which is if you have fine-grained stripes, you can read for a single file faster, but you might have to wait longer because you have to wait for everybody else ahead of you to read their files. You have less parallelism across files. You have parallelism within a file where you read one file from lots of disks. You can't read from different files. With coarse grain, you can read from different files, but you get less performance within a single file. And so you can really set this on your workload. What is more important to you? You know, um, if, for example, your workload is really reading one gigantic file, um, then you may want to have relatively small granularity. This is why thinking machines went with, with one bit granularity, is that they were just reading these gigantic files and they would always read from all 32 disks or write to all 32 disks, and it performed really well for that workload. If you've got a database, um, you might want something different. So the other question, <coughs> trade-off we have, is if we have some redundant information, which basically means extra copies of data, there's sort of two things we can do. One option is we can say, we're going to make this our redundancy disk. So all of our redundancy is on one disk. Another option is that we can put a little bit of redundancy on every disk and kind of spread it out. Um, and these have various different trade-offs also. And we'll see the impact of that. So if we now go through kind of the taxonomy of different ways of doing this, um, we're just going to start at kind of the basic approach, which is just a bunch of disks, which is really not RAID at all because there's no striping. So the way people implement bunch, a bunch of disks is they use what's called a pseudo driver. So if you have your operating system here, then you have sort of a disk driver here. And we'll assume that you have a disk driver for each disk. And then the way that people implement any kind of RAID is you basically stick a layer in the middle here. And when you want to access a file, the operating system will send a logical block address to this RAID driver. The RAID driver will then decide which disks to send this to. So it will then decide whether to send it to this, 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 or this disk. So for just a bunch of disks, <coughs> all you have to do is basically partition the range of logical block addresses. So this means this zero, as I said, would be zero to a million. This would be a million, and this would be so we're just going to partition our address space across this is one simple way of doing this. Um, and so this just means when you write to a block, the RAID driver will figure out um, which disk it should go to and will send the request there. Um, this is slightly more sophisticated, by the way, than the approach I mentioned before of putting a different directory on each disk. Because this says we're just going to sort of spread the blocks out. We don't know where the files and directories themselves go. Okay. So the RAID people define striping as RAID level 0. Um, and RAID level 0 basically says the partitioning function... If we have n disks, the address um, that you use on a given disk is just the logical block address modulo the number of disks. This is the remainder when you divide, um, wait, I take that back, divided by the number of disks. The address, the disk is the, uh, the logical block address modulo the number of disks. So if you have address 15, you have four disks. Um, 15 mod 4 is 3. We're going to write to disk number 3. The address that we write to is 15 divided by 4, uh, which is uh, 3. So um, it's a, and again, so again, it's a very simple function of where to write your data. 
But I think we've covered this performs really well, but it has very bad reliability characteristics. Any questions so far? No, this should, I think, be all repeat. Okay, so now we're getting to new stuff. So a very simple thing you can do is you can basically take two disks and make them act like one disk. This is called RAID 1 or mirroring. And it says whenever you write a block of data, instead of writing the one disk, we write the two disks. When we read a block of data, we only need to read from one disk, though, because we're going to assume these disks are fail stop. And so if we try to read and we get, we'll never get the wrong value, we'll just get a failure. If we get a failure, we can switch to the other disk. Um. <coughs> So the other thing we can do is when you read, you can also, if you want to be smarter, you could pick the fastest disk. So if, there are, if the disk arms are in different positions on the two disks, you could decide to read from the one that has the shorter seek time. So you can actually make performance slightly better. So when we look at the capacity of this, clearly we're losing some capacity. We bought two disks, we're only storing one disk worth of data. So it's not quite as good. What about the reliability of this? In this system, how good is the reliability compared to a single disk? What? So uh, it could be twice as good. It's actually a lot better than twice as good. Because to think about it, what do you need to have happen to lose your data? Right? So if you think about it, what is the problem? You need both disks to fail to lose your data. So what is the probability that both disks fail? So the probability of one disk failing, we said, was something like 2%. And then the probability of the other disk failing is also 2%. So our reliability is actually like 100 times better than a single disk here. Because the chances of both disks failing at the same time is really low. So in contrast, when we had either disk failing, we had the re when we had striping, it was the reverse thing, where we didn't need both to fail, we needed both to survive. That's why when we were looking at normal striping, it was 0.98 times 0.98. Um, here, so this shows that you can build a really reliable system because the chance of both disks failing is really, really low. So what do you do in RAID 1 if a disk fails? Well, while the disk has failed, you just read and write from the disk that still works. You ignore the failed disk. You go out and you buy a new disk, you stick it in your system, and then you do what's called reconstruction, which says we copy all the data off the good disk onto the bad disk. Any sense of how, how long that takes? Assuming you have a disk already, how slow or fast is reconstruction? How would you know how fast it is? Well, we know how big a disk is. So it's roughly the time it takes to copy everything from one disk to another disk. Because we don't really actually know on a disk where the data is. We sort of assume the disk itself doesn't know what's data and what's deleted files. So we can, we'll just assume from the disk perspective everything is good. But so basically, recovery means copy every byte off one disk onto another disk. So how long does it take to copy everything off a disk? Yes. Uh, your what speed? Well, okay, so how long is that? So we went over some numbers. Suppose you have a terabyte disk and you can write 100 megabytes per second. So that's what, 10,000 seconds? So that's about three hours. So what that says is there's a three hour window now when if you have a failure while you're doing this copy, that's when you lose data, is only in this three hour window. But it also says that's a three-hour window when your performance is not very good. Because in addition to serving your normal requests, you have to do this reconstruction. So that is a substantial cost um, in using RAID is actually copying all the data off. So if we look at performance, we can look at what is the performance for sequential and random workloads for read and for write. Well, for reads, we can read from both disks. And so really, if we look at if B is the bandwidth of one disk, then the bandwidth that we get for reads is really 2 times B. Because if we're doing sequential, well, basically, we can read from both disks at once for sequential reads. If we're doing random, we can read different things from each disk, and still we'll get to read twice as much. So you roughly get double, you roughly get double the performance of a single disk by having two disks per read. So that looks pretty good. For sequential writes, 
uh, you have to write to both drives. So uh, you basically, uh, because you're writing twice the data to twice the drives, you still only get to write sort of the bandwidth amount of data at a time. So your bandwidth for writes is still B. We're not getting any benefit on making writes faster. For random writes, similarly, we have to write the data to both drives, and so the bandwidth is about B. And in fact, for random writes, performance could be a little worse. Because with, with random writes, you have to seek both drives, and for it to complete, you have to wait for the worst of those two writes to complete. So it's sort of, with reads, you can read from the faster of two disks, so it's faster, but with writes, you pay for the time of the slower of the two disks. Um, and so the bandwidth for write, random writes can be a little bit lower than B here. So does this make sense, how we're sort of calculating the read and write performance of things? I see vague nods or people not returning my stare. So I'll take that as a yes. Um, OK, we already talked about the failure rates. OK, so RAID 1 had a problem that the performance, we only had two disks. Um, and so the performance wasn't that great. And it had the problem that our write performance wasn't that good. We couldn't do any faster than writing to a single disk. So there's another approach we can use, which is called RAID 4. And RAID 4 says, instead of having a complete copy of the data, we're going to use this error correcting code approach. And we're going to do it with what's called parity. And if you've ever used a modem, you may remember having parity bits and like even odd parity if you're old enough to have used modems. But parity is basically a very simple error correcting code. And the way parity works is you take some stream of data and you count the number of ones in the data. And the parity bit is the number of ones. So in this example, I have one, two, three, four, five, one. So the parity is one. If I had four ones, the parity would be zero because there's an odd number of ones. So it just tells you even or odd number of ones. A very cheap way to compute this is to use XOR. So XOR says if you take two bits and you XOR them and they're different, it's a one. If they're the same, it's a zero. So XOR will tell you when you XOR two numbers, are there an odd number of ones or an even number of ones? So if I XOR 1 and 0 together, I get 1 because there's, a, there's 1. If I XOR 1 and 1 together, I get a 0. So that tells me the parity would be 0. And you can just XOR all the bits together, XOR these two, and then this, 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 and then this. And you XOR all together like this, and that tells you what the parity is for a string of bits. So how do we use this for reconstruction following a failure? Well. Suppose we have this value here. We have this string here. We know the parity was 1. We know all these other bits were 1. And we're missing one bit in the middle. What is this bit in the middle? Well, it's really easy to figure it out because we can say, well, we have 1, 2, 3, 4 1s here. The parity bit was 1, which meant there should have been an odd number of 1s. That tells us that this had to be a 1 because we need an odd number and we only have an even number. If this was a zero, it would tell us that this had to be a zero because we need an even number of ones. So that's how parity can help us um, repair a missing bit. One thing to note is, suppose we don't know which of these bits is wrong. Can parity help us then? We know there's some error, but we don't know where. And the answer is, you can't, it can't really help you there because you don't know which of the bits is wrong. You have to know which of these is unknown to know which you can repair? So it can't help you detect an error. It doesn't do error detection. It really does error correction in a way. You know, I guess it'll tell you, it can tell you if something's wrong, but not what is wrong. If you know what's wrong, it'll tell you the right answer. So it's very limited. In the context of disks, suppose we basically take one bit from each block. We, we take one bit of, uh, and we put one bit on each disk then we'll have the, another place where we store the parity for those bits. If we think of this as a whole disk, if we lose this whole disk and we know we lost it, we can compute whatever was on this disk. That's kind of the key idea. So let's look at how this manifests in RAID 4. So with RAID 4, what we will do is write, we will, we will go back to striping here. So striping, remember, gave us great performance. We're going to take our data and we're going to stripe it across n minus 1 disks where n is the total number of disks in your system. So here, we have five disks. We'll stripe it across the data across the first four disks. And then we'll put the parity on this final disk. And what this parity means is that we'll basically take these blocks here, the, whatever these little 
how about however much data we write here, we will do a byte-wise XOR. So we'll XOR the first byte of this with the first byte of this with the first byte of this with the first byte of this, write it as the first byte here. And then the second byte of this, second byte, second byte, second byte, becomes the second byte here. So we're going to compute this at a byte-wise parity and write out a block that is the parity of every byte that was written out to the other disk. And we're going to put all the parity on this dedicated parity disk. <clears throat> so operationally, when we want to read from data, remember our disks tell us if they fail. So when we read from data, we just ignore the parity disk, and it's just like reading from RAID 0 or striping. We just read from these four disks. And we get really good read performance. We get n minus 1 times better read performance than we did otherwise. When we write the data, though, we have to up compute new parity. So this means that writes can be more expensive because we now, in addition to writing the data over here, we have to write it over here. When we have a failure, what do we do? So if we know, for example, that this disk failed and we need the data, but suppose we want to read stripe 3 here. How do we do that? We're going to read in these three blocks here. We'll read in the parity here. And then we'll compute what was the missing data. And that will tell us whatever data we lost on this disk. And that's how, with one extra disk, we can handle the failure of any of these four disks. Because we can recompute whatever was there from the parity disk. So that's what makes this kind of nice, because with one extra disk, we can now tolerate the failure of any of four disks. And if the parity disk itself fails, well, we didn't really need the parity disk. It was just in case there's a failure. We'll just read from these disks over here instead. So that's how RAID 4 works. Does that make sense? Yes? So is this done like in addition to the error correcting codes on the disk itself? Yes. So the disk internally has error correcting codes, which is how you know that a read fails in a way, perhaps. Um, and this is done sort of across that in case a read fails on one, like if a read fails on this disk, you can then reconstruct the missing data by reading from over here. And the read can fail if the error correcting code on a disk isn't powerful enough to recover the missing data. In the back. What if you lose two disks? You're out of luck. So this only handles a single disk failure. And the idea is if you calculate the probability of losing two disks, um, it's still, you've still got about 100 years. So your, your chance of having two disk failures in a year, rather, is like 0.1%, 1 in 1,000. So it's unlikely you'll lose two disks in one year. Um, but it's more likely now, because you have five disks, the chance of two out of five failing is higher than two out of two. Um, so it is a real problem. And we will get to later what you do about this, about that problem. OK, so um, the net result is the reliability is pretty good, is good here because we can handle two failures. <clears throat> so what about the performance? Well, for sequential and random reads, we ignore the parity disk. We read from n minus 1 disks. So we get the bandwidth of a single disk times n minus 1 as the bandwidth of the array. So that looks pretty good for reads. If we're doing sequential writes, then things aren't too bad. If you do a sequential write, this means we're writing all the way across the whole array in one chunk. So we're writing enough data to write to every single disk. So to do a sequential write, we take we have the data in memory, we compute new parity, then we write out all the data and the new parity at once. So this means that uh, we're writing to all n disks, but we're only writing n minus 1 disks of good data. So our sequential write performance is the same as read. It's b times n minus 1. Because we're getting the bandwidth of four disks, even though we bought five disks. So that looks reasonably good. The challenge comes from random writes. So the problem with random writes is that we need to update the parity disk with the new, the, writing a random block changes the parity. So if I go back here, if I change, say, stripe 6, right? what that really means is I change stripe 6 and I change the parity for this uh, line right here. Right? Because the parity used to be for a different value of stripe 6. When I write new data here, the parity changes. So I've got to update the parity. Um, I have to compute new parity to write out here. So the question for you is, how do you compute new parity? How do you know what the new value to put in 
this parity disk should be when you're only updating a single block or a single thread. Any thoughts on how you might do that? Right, so one option is you can read in the other disks, n minus two data disks actually. You can read in these three disks to read the other values, take the value you're about to write, compute parity, and then write it back out. So to write a single block, we've now read three blocks and written two blocks. So we've done five disk operations to write a single block. Did you have a comment? Uh, couldn't you just look at what you're overwriting? So that's the other approach. So what you mentioned is called additive parity, where we are going to basically compute new parity from all the data by adding it all together. The other alternative, which is what you're suggesting, is let's read the, before we update this, let's read the old value, read the old parity, and then sort of subtract this out of the old parity, and then add back in the new block to compute the new parity. So we can basically read how many ones there were um, in this stripe, subtract that number of ones from the parity, figure out how many ones are in the new stripe, add that back into the parity, and then write them both out. This is called subtractive parity, because we're going to subtract out the old parity before we add the new one in. So the difference is, if we're doing additive parity, we have to read from all these other disks here um, before we compute parity. If we're doing subtractive parity, we have to read from just these two disks. We still have to do a read, but we only read two disks. In this case, we have to read three disks. And so, depending on your system, it can, you know, depending if you had, suppose you had 15 disks instead of five disks, there'd be a pretty big difference because in additive parity, you'd read from 14 disks and write the two disks. In subtractive parity, you read from two disks and write the two disks. So which one is better kind of depends on whether you have a lot of disks or not so many disks. But the net result is still you have to do extra work. So writing a, ran, a small random write can be pretty slow in this system. That's kind of the most important thing. So if we look at the actual performance, so what happens? Well, sequential and random reads, are good, you know, we've got bandwidth n minus one, sequential writes, we can see here, for random writes, all the updates have to go to the parity disk. So there's another problem here, which is that we fundamentally, every single write has to touch the parity disk. So if we write a single block, we go to the, we always update the parity disk, right? So this limits the speed of random writes to the speed of the parity disk, because we need to access it on every single write to write out new parity. So random writes will never be faster than bandwidth of a single of a single disk. But it's actually worse than that because if we're doing subtractive writes, we actually need to read the parity disk first to read the old parity to update it before we write it out. So we're doing two operations, a read on a write on the parity disk. This means that our bandwidth is actually half of that of a single disk. Because every single update will now read the parity disk compute new parity and write the parity disk. So every write to any block reads the parity disk and writes the parity disk. So it's two parity disk operations for every block write anywhere else. Um, if we do additive parity, it's equally bad because we're gonna read all the other disks, the other 14 disks in your system, and then write it out. So those other 14 disks become a limit also. And so you end up with a single, similar result of having bandwidth at, at sort of a single disk or below. Um, and so RAID 4 performance, you know, really the key problem here is that having a single parity disk is a bottleneck because every write touches that parity disk. Any questions on RAID 4? Okay, so what can we do? Well, let's have more than one parity disk. Easy, simple, easy problem, right? We've got five disks in our system. Let's put parity on all five disks. So this is really what RAID 5 is. And it basically says... Instead of having a single parity disk, on every one of these stripes across here, we're going to move the parity to a different disk. So for this first stripe here, the parity disk is blocked with disk 5. For the next stripe across here, parity is disk on disk 4. For the first, third stripe over here, parity is disk on disk 3. So what this means is that we still have the same problem that when you want to do a write, you either need to read in all the disks and recompute parity, or you need to read the parity disk and write the parity disk. If you're doing the same operations. The difference is here, if you're operating on blocks in different stripes, then that parity disk is a different disk. 
So we can now distribute the parity operations. Instead of all of them on one disk, we can distribute them across all our disks. So we can do parity operations in parallel now. We can do five different parity updates on five disks at the same time. Previously, we had to do all of the five updates on one disk, and they would take five times longer. So this means that writes get a lot faster here because we can distribute that parity. So if we look at performance, the uh, sequential random read is exactly the same as RAID 4. We can read from n minus 1 disks. Sequential writes is exactly the same as RAID 4 because we're just going to write all the data and the parity all at once. So we get n minus 1 times bandwidth. For random writes, uh, what we see is that we have the uh, that we have to do four operations now to do an update. To do, we're going to assume subtractive updates. We have to read two blocks, the old parity, the old data. We write two blocks, the new parity, the new data. So this means that our bandwidth is really the number of disks divided by four, because we have to do four operations. But we can do them in parallel on different disks. So our small write bandwidth now is much better than just B over two. If you have uh, four disks, you get B. If you pick, have eight disks, uh, then you get uh, then you get uh, the speed of two disks or something like that, double uh, two times b. So your small write bandwidth is, is substantially better if you have enough disks. So for this reason, RAID 5 is pretty popular. RAID 4 is pretty unpopular. If we look at if you look at sort of reconstruction, what do you do on a failure? It's the same in both cases. Um, so I talked about what to do if a block is missing. What do you do when you buy a new disk? Um, if you have a, what do you do if a, if, a, if a disk permanently fails? You know, if this disk is actually failed, then all this data you just read because you, you don't they need the parity. For these over for this missing block over here, you'll recompute it from the parity in these three. Um, and so you can operate by recomputing the missed data from the parity. And then when you buy a new disk and stick it in. You can basically go through the algorithm and recompute what should be on that missing disk. So for um, RAID 1, we talked about how long does it take to reconstruct. How long does it take to reconstruct a missing disk in RAID 5? So in RAID 1, remember, we have to read everything off one disk and write it onto another disk. How does that change with RAID 5? This actually is a question on the graduate qualifying exam. About the why you say it's about the same. Why is it about the same? Right, exactly. So we're going to read basically. We're going to read a stripe at a time from all four disks. We'll compute a new value and write it out. So we will sort of continuously read these four disks at full speed, compute the data, and continuously write to this disk at full speed. So we're going to saturate all five disks the whole time we're reconstructing, but. Fundamentally, we are reading one disk worth of data from each of these disks and writing one worth of disk worth of data from this disk. So it should be about the same amount of elapsed time as uh, in other systems, in the other case. Um, so we talked about the issues. So somebody had the question of what if you have two disk failures? If you have a lot of disks that can happen, people have come up with RAID 6. And RAID 6 is like RAID 5, but instead of one parity bit, it has two parity bits. And with two parity bits, you can handle two disks failing. Um, it's less efficient, as you'd imagine, because there's more parity to update now. Um, it can do better with on reads because you have more disks, but it's slower on writes because you have more parity to update. One interesting problem with RAID, though, is it turns out humans are a problem. So if you buy a RAID array, what happens is you get a box. And in it, there's a bunch of disks, like this. And so at some point, if you're using RAID and a disk fails, as an administrator, you will learn that one of your disks has failed. It turns out administrators are really bad at pulling out the right disk. So they will say, disk 4 has failed. You'll walk over, you'll say, well, 1, 2, 3, 4, pull this one out. Well, it turns out they were starting at 0, and they wanted you to pull out um, a different disk in this one instead. Now you have two disk failures, and you lose all your data. So this is actually one of the most common failure modes with RAID, is that a disk fails and people don't repair it because the system works so well. They didn't even notice that it failed. 
or it failed and they replaced the wrong disk and they throw out the disk with good data and leave the bad disk in there. So the first thing that, that RAID manufacturers did is they put a little light on here and they would have green lights and red lights. And the red lights would mean pull this one out. And it turns out that wasn't enough, you would think. And so what they do now is they put in physical interlocks that physically lock the good disks in there so you can't pull them out. <laughs> so you can only pull out the disk that doesn't actually work. Because you think about it, I mean, everything else, the software works fine, but you can't prevent a stupid human from doing the wrong thing. And so they really, so it turns out human operator error is a big source of, of, of things going wrong. And so this is what you need to prevent humans from doing the wrong thing. It's like physical, mechanical locks that only let you do the one right thing. Um, but if you, if you forget to replace the disk, you still have a problem. That happened at, when I was in graduate school. The lab forgot to replace the disk, and they lost everybody's home directories. Uh, only about a week worth of data. But you can imagine a lot can happen in a week. Okay, so let's stop there. Um, we will touch for a few minutes on RAID on Thursday, and then move on to file systems.